All right, so, hey, Glenn, do you mind turning me down on just on the mains on the speaker? If you can just bring those down, and I should still be on the live stream, although I wasn't last week. But this week I made sure the um, receiver was turned on. That's what it was, I think. I went up there a minute ago, and the receiver was not on. I think that's what happened last week. So, that's good. Okay, good. I feel like I don't need to be in the speakers when it's just us, right? Okay. I really don't need the speakers on Sunday mornings, but... All right, so last week we started talking about the New Covenant. And most of the time last week we focused upon the relationship between the New Covenant and what the writer of Hebrews calls the Old Covenant, otherwise known as the Mosaic Covenant, or the Covenant at Sinai, or the Covenant with Israel, whatever you want to call it. Um, But most of our time last week was sort of uh, spent talking about the relationship between these two covenants. And we, we had a list of, I don't know, six or seven contrasts or differences between the New Covenant and the Old Covenant. And so what I want to try to do tonight to finish out our study is to talk about the relationship between the New Covenant and the other covenants of the Old Testament. That's what most of our time will be spent doing. And I built in, we're just kind of finishing things up tonight, so we should have plenty of time for questions and discussion, all right? So jumping back in, of course, you have to go to Jeremiah chapter 31 when you talk about the new covenant, where Jeremiah writes, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now when we read that in in Jeremiah, one of the more interesting points to make about these new covenant promises concerns the addressees, um, the people that are addressed. Uh, in there, in there, you notice that God promises to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and then He says, "This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel." And even when you look in Ezekiel's new covenant promises, you see there a new heart and a new spirit. Spirit in that passage are addressed to the house of Israel, but that Jesus and the apostles apply these covenant promises to the church is really indisputable. There's no doubt that these promises that are addressed to Israel and Judah are applied to the church, which is composed of both Jews and Gentiles. So, for instance, Jesus speaks of his death on the cross in the institution of the Lord's Supper, and he says, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And then Paul takes those words and applies them to the church. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So the church really is, in Paul's understanding of things, the new covenant community. And so the Lord's Supper is a celebration of the institution of the new covenant through Christ's blood. And that can create problems for those who want to maintain a really sharp division between the church and Israel. It really can. Because you have promises made to Israel or Judah applied directly to the church. In fact, um, when we, you know, I won't draw it up here again. I've done it several times. The little continuum of views on the relationships between the Old and New Testament where you have a lot of continuity on this end, a lot of, you know, overlapping between the two and a lot of discontinuity on this end. And on this end, we had dispensationalism. And um, at one point in time, early dispensationalists um, argued that there were actually two new covenants. Because you can't get, oh, get past Jesus' words recorded by Paul and applied to the church about a new covenant. And yet they read Jeremiah the way that they read all of the promises to Israel as directly directed only at Israel. And so it, they, they, they came up with this idea of two new covenants, one for the church, one for Israel. 
But that runs into issues because the writer of Hebrews specifically quotes Jeremiah in his exposition of the new covenant. And he's writing, of course, um, not to a future generation of Jewish believers, but to current Jewish believers and probably Gentiles in the mix as well depending on what you do with some of the stuff in Hebrews. But, but that really won't work as a solution. It's pretty clear in the New Testament um, that the, the new covenant is fulfilled in, in and concerns the church. So whatever you make of the relationship between, the old, between Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church, and again, there's a spectrum of opinions on that, what you have to bear in mind is that the new covenant finds its fulfillment in the church, Christ's body. Whatever you might believe about the other promises made to Israel in the Old Testament. And Christians have disagreed on that for quite a while now. The New Covenant promises at, le at the very least are fulfilled in the church. And so we saw, I mentioned this earlier, that the New Covenant succeeds where the Old Covenant with Israel fell short. That's one of the things we talked about last week in the relationship between the New Covenant and the Old Covenant. And so the writer of Hebrews points to the temporary nature of the Old Covenant as opposed to the eternal nature of the New Covenant. That was one of the distinctions that we looked at last week in that list of differences between the Old and New Covenant. Hebrews 8.13. In speaking of a New Covenant, he makes the first one, so that's the Mosaic Covenant, obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So, one of the things you realize as you, as you really read through the Old Testament and begin to pay attention to some of the details is that the Mosaic Covenant or the Covenant with Israel is never described in the Old Testament as an eternal covenant or as an everlasting covenant. But the New Covenant is. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. So the new covenant is described as everlasting or eternal, but the old covenant is never described that way. Okay, that's fair, but we talked about that last week. What does that have to do with the other covenants? Well, interestingly, or at least to me it's interesting. I don't know, maybe not to you. But the other covenants that we've talked about, creation, um, Abraham, and David... They are all described as everlasting covenants. All three of them. I'll give you some scripture references here. We have the creation covenant, which is renewed in Genesis 9. There's a reference in Isaiah 24 back to that. There is uh, the covenant with Abraham, which is actually, there are five different times that it's called an everlasting covenant. I just gave you two from Genesis 17. You have the covenant with David in 2 Samuel 23.5. All, in all of these places, all of these other covenants are called everlasting covenants. So while we've talked about the new covenant superseding or replacing the old covenant, we can't, we can't use that exact same language when we talk about these other covenants. In other words, we can't say, ah, the covenant with Abraham is just shoved aside now that we have the new covenant, or the covenant with David is just pushed aside. We can't say that because they are actually described as everlasting covenants. So there's two options that are open to us. Either these covenants, creation, Abrahamic, and Davidic, will be fulfilled at a future time period And pr probably the best candidate for that future time period would be the thousand years mentioned in Revelation 20, otherwise known as the millennium. That's end time stuff that we're not going to get into tonight. But that's one option to say that those covenants are fulfilled then, since they're eternal, and we don't want to say that they've been replaced or done away with by the new covenant. Or we might say that they point forward to the new covenant and have been or are being, in a sense, not replaced by or superseded by the New Covenant, but are fulfilled within the New Covenant. So in my opinion, I think that the, the evidence from the Bible 
fits the latter option a little better. And that helps us if we can see that the creation covenant, but then especially the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants, reach their fulfillment in the new covenant. They're not done away with, they're actually tied to and fulfilled within the new covenant. If we can see that, then it makes sense, it'll make a little bit more sense to us why the new covenant would be addressed to Israel, but fulfilled in the church. Does that make sense? If I lose you, just say you lost me. I'm confused. Okay. So we'll do what we've done several times. We'll focus on themes, okay? The two, two main themes, the land and the seed. Okay, so we have these dual themes of seed and land, and they're really found in all the covenants in the Old Testament. They dominate the whole story in which the descendants or seed of Abraham wait for the promised land, then they enter and conquer the land, and they live in the land for a while, and then finally they are expelled from the land before they then return to the land. So this is the seed of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham, and they have a relationship with the land throughout the Old Testament. But we can even back up before Abraham, right? Because these themes originate before Abraham. Adam and Eve were commanded to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, that's the word land, same word, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and every living thing that moves on the earth or the land. Now, that word in Genesis 1 through 2, just because of the context, refers to all the land in the world. But still, the creation covenant includes man's dwelling in and ruling over the land. So we have the land theme. And then you see, just like we see later in the story, Adam and Eve are evicted from the, the part of the land, the piece of the land, where God's presence was manifest when they fell into sin. And then in the same way, later in the story, Israel is exiled from the promised land and the city of Jerusalem in the temple, the place where God dwelt, are destroyed. After the fall in Genesis 3, we're actually told that it is through Eve's seed that God will bring about the serpent's defeat and the reversal of the curse that was brought into the world through sin. So when we look at the story of creation, we see the land was in a sense, and I put this in quotation marks, was in a sense lost by means of covenant breaking. They broke the covenant, they disobeyed the terms of the covenant, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. but that the curses will come to an end when the promise of the seed is fulfilled. And then when you read through the Bible, one way to read through the Bible, and these are only two themes, they're important themes, there are other themes we can do this with as well, but when you read through the Bible, one of the things that you can do is look for where these themes crop up again. And for those of you who remember, a couple of years ago, I preached a series in the summer called Threads. And I took several of these themes, land and seed were actually two of them, but I took several of these themes and I traced them from Genesis to Revelation, showing you how they tie into all the major parts of the story of the Bible. Um, so you can do that with any theme. What we're going to do is we're going to take seed and land and we're just going to pay attention to their relationship between the covenants, which we've also called the backbone of the story. So it makes sense that we can do that. All right, so let's jump in with Abraham. So these two themes are repeated. They receive even greater emphasis in God's covenant with Abraham. In the midst of the covenant ceremony, God promises Abraham to your offspring. Literally, that's the word seed. Same word that we see in Genesis 3.15. To your offspring, I give this land. There they are. The difference between the emphasis with Adam at creation and right here with Abraham is just one of scope. That's all. 
the land in the early chapters of Genesis is the whole world, right? Just like the temple is the garden, okay? The place where God meets with his people. The land is the whole world, the, whole, the area, and then in, with, um, oh yeah, and Adam's and Noah's descendants include all of mankind. So what we're going to do is we're going to shrink those down, okay? So what we see is the land of promise is a microcosm of the whole earth or all the land over which man is to exercise dominion. And then, of course, the, the whole of mankind being sort of comprehended in the seed is now reduced down to Abraham's seed, right? So you're contracting. You have the whole world. Now you have the promised land. You have mankind. Now you have just Abraham's descendants. You move forward in the story, same thing. See the same kind of development when we get to 2 Samuel 7 and the offspring, the, the, uh, the covenant God makes with David. We see offspring seed in here. 2 Samuel 7, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring, your seed after you, who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So now the line of the seed has been contracted further so that within Abraham's line, we have David's family line. But of course, the land over which David's descendants will rule doesn't change between Abraham and David. It stays the same. But what we're told is that the kingdom that's going to be established will endure forever. So from creation to Abraham to David, what we are seeing is the same basic promises, but they're changing shape a little bit. With the seed promise, you're narrowing down from all of mankind to Abraham to David. With the land promise, you at least narrow down from the whole world down to the land of promise. But they're the same basic promises. All right, so I'm on page 134. New Covenant Fulfillment. What we've seen several times is that the ultimate seed of the woman, of Abraham, of David, is actually Jesus. And we've also seen that the original command to mankind to have dominion over the earth is ultimately fulfilled in the new heavens and new earth. So we read in Revelation 21, John says... Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. So the picture in Revelation at the end of the story is that the promised seed has reversed God's curse and brought an end to exile. And we see in Romans chapter 8 that even creation itself rejoices in that day, that future day. The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. That's the fall. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be set free. That's the future new heavens and new earth. From its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. Until now. So what Abraham hoped for and what the promised land represented has been won by Christ. This is why the writer of Hebrews says that Abraham was looking forward to a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. And that the saints of the Old Testament, in a broader sense, Desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. 
So these major themes tied to all the covenants, but especially creation, Abraham, and David, these major themes find their fulfillment in Christ and in His people. He's the promised seed, seed of Abraham, seed of the woman, seed of David. And He ushers in the new heavens and new earth, fulfilling Abraham's hope for a city whose designer and builder is God and the other Old Testament saints' hope for a heavenly, better country. Seed and land. Fulfilled in Christ in the new covenant. So I'm going to pause before I go on to my conclusions and see if you guys have questions or want some clarification on some stuff. No? 136? I haven't covered it yet. 136? Before I get to my conclusions. Nope. Well, I just kind of talk and it's easy to get lost in all of it. I get it. Sometimes I get lost. This week, finally, on the last week of the study, I thought, I'm not going to print it two-sided. I keep getting lost. It's easier this way. So I figured it out on the last week. No? You guys good? Okay. All right, so conclusions. So if the two primary themes of the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants have been fulfilled in the New Covenant, then we have to conclude that these covenants themselves are fulfilled in the people of the new covenant. So that's why Paul calls Gentile believers sons of Abraham in Genesis 3.7. And in Genesis 3.14, he says that these Gentile believers have received the blessing of Abraham. Interestingly, the blessing of Abraham... Um, does anybody have anybody want to turn to Galatians 3.14? I'll just show you this. This is interesting because it really ties into the new covenant. Remember, the, in Ezekiel, the new covenant promise is directly related to God putting His Spirit right within His people. New heart, new spirit. Okay. That's really important. Um, Galatians 3.14 makes a connection between the blessing of Abraham and then the, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Anybody got it? Okay, read the, just read all of Galatians 3.14. Okay, so it's really interesting. The, the way it's worded is you have parallel statements so that the blessing of Abraham, and then so that the promise, and I'm doing a little bit of a shortening here, but you have the blessing of Abraham as paralleled with the promised Holy Spirit, right? So how is the, how is the, what is the blessing of Abraham in Galatians 3.14? It is the coming of the Spirit. So that the promises of the Abrahamic covenant find their fulfillment in the new covenant. So through faith in Christ, we are adopted into Abraham's family and God's family. We become recipients of Abraham's great hope, the heavenly city, the better country. And then in addition, we also have Jesus as our eternal king. The Davidic king, Jesus, is Lord over the earth, the whole world, and king over our lives, so that we will live with him in his kingdom in the new heavens and new earth forever. And, just to add to it, according to 2 Timothy 2.12, we will reign with him. So the new covenant is more than just a new covenant. It is the means by which all of God's covenantal promises to His people are fulfilled. 
So it's not strange when you think about it in this, in this light that the New Testament would be addressed to Israel and applied to the church. Because the people of God are not ultimately designated by their ethnicity or their cultural background, but by faith in Christ. Christ, who, by the way, is presented in the New Testament as the true Israel. I'll give you one example of that. Um, in Isaiah, Isaiah several times uses the image of Israel as either a vineyard or a vine. Okay? Um, and he, he has this really... In, in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 5, he, God tears down the vineyard because the vineyard has been unfaithful and broken the covenant. But then in Isaiah 27... God reconstitutes his people as a, a well-watered garden that bears fruit that fills the entire world, right? And he uses some of the language from chapter 5 to describe that. So it's like a reversal of that. But when you get to the New Testament, when Jesus borrows that same imagery, Jesus says, I am the true vine. But Jesus also does some destructive work, right? Because every branch that doesn't remain in them, he prunes and tears off. So for, for Jesus, he is, what that Isaiah imagery about Israel as the vine is pointing toward, it's pointing toward him. He's the true vine. And you see that kind of stuff scattered throughout the Gospels. So that what I would say is that Jesus is the true Israel and that we are grafted into him by faith. So I would not really argue that the church replaces Israel in any sense. I would argue that the church is grafted onto Israel. But as it turns out, the true Israel, the true seed of Abraham, happens to be Jesus. So whether we are natural branches, Jews, or grafted branches, Gentiles, we receive the covenant blessings, Abrahamic, Davidic, and new. We receive the covenant blessings by our union with Christ. So make sure you're united to Christ by faith. That's how you get all the blessings and all the promises. All right, we have a whole 16 minutes to spare. So questions, comments, observations. It's the same promises. So, and this, that's true for, for everyone. For old, for old Testament believers, they're looking forward to those promises, and we're largely looking back. But it's the same promises. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good way. It's a good illustration. Yeah. It's new in contrast with the old. That's where we, you know, both in Jeremiah and in Hebrews, it's called new because it contrasts with the old, which is the mosaic. Any other questions or comments? It's all that clear. You understand the covenants now? Good. Okay. That's what, yeah. 
All right, so if you need any of the blanks filled in, I'll leave it right here, and we'll just finish early. And we can hang out and visit, or if you've got to get somewhere, you can get somewhere early, okay? Let me close this in prayer. Um, thanks, guys, for being here every week. Oh, well, well let me do this. Um, let's take two or three minutes so you guys can give me your ideas for what we're going to study next. I have a lot of things that I can do. Nothing is set in stone, although I won't go too far afield from what I'm prepared to start in a week. Um, but if you guys have some suggestions or requests on what we would do next on Wednesday nights, what are you, what are you thinking about? What are you interested in? And it can be a theological type thing, or it can be more of a practical Christian living type thing. doesn't matter to me. Uh, gosh, there are so many things, to be honest. Um, I mean, we can, if we're talking theology, we can do something on the doctrine of God. I don't know when the last time we did the Trinity was, but I feel like it wasn't that long ago, was it? Have we done it recently? No? Yes? Okay. We can do, um, we can do doctrine of salvation, um, and something related there, and that can go in a lot of different directions. Have I done what? The new birth. Yeah, that could be part of like a study of salvation. We could walk through those different aspects of salvation. Just the atonement. We could spend a few weeks just on talking about atonement. Yeah. The book of Revelation? No, we haven't. Mm -mm. We've, done, we've done my end times essentials class where I'll, I just present the different views but I've not walked through the book of Revelation with you guys. That's your vote? Everybody likes end time stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You get a crowd for about the first half of it. <laughs> but that's apparently true for everything. All right, any other suggestions? I mean, there's lots of other things. We did marriage fairly recently. Um, it's not been that long since we've done things on prayer, but we could do something on prayer and fasting, maybe. Uh, the book of Judges? Yep, we could do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be fun. Anything else? I'll take everything into consideration. But the book studies I usually try to hold for Sunday mornings and do a little bit more topical type stuff on Wednesday nights because there's no other time when I have to cover things that we're not just encountering. That's the thing, when you're preaching verse by verse, you don't get to pick what you talk about. Whatever's next. Next paragraph, next verse, that's next. But sometimes there are other things you do need to talk about that are not in the next paragraph. So that's why I do like to do topical stuff if we can on Wednesdays. So, think about it. I don't know that we have. Have we? I, I can't recall doing anything in a long, long time. I know I did an evangelism, a how-to evangelism thing, and a part of that was we took people from different worldviews, and some of those were religious worldviews, and talked about how to share the gospel with them. But that's been at least four or five years since I did that. We could do something like that. It wasn't just religions, but those were some of them. And so I had to do some summarizing of what those religions believed. But we also did things like agnostics and atheists or nominal Christians. That was the most applicable one. So, so think about it, and then if you come up with an idea, text me or email me, and I'll put it in the pot, stir it all up, and see what comes out. Okay? All right. Now I'll close this in prayer. God, I thank you for letting us do this study on the covenants. You could have cut us short in a lot of ways, and you didn't, and so we're thankful for your grace there. And we're thankful most of all, though, that you are a faithful covenant-making God. You always fulfill your promises. And even when you demand things in your word, things that we cannot do, you sent your Son into the world to meet those demands on our behalf. And we're thankful for his sacrifice for us, not just in dying for our sins, but in living 
a life of righteousness that we couldn't live. And entering into a broken, fallen world with all of its pain and sickness and heartache and living a holy and righteous life for us. We thank you that we can trust you because we see as we look back your covenant faithfulness in the past. And so we know we can trust you moving forward. And I pray that that would be an encouragement for all of us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A really... Oh, I thought you said D.